people together on mission. Um, Neil and I uh, and our churches have recently gotten together because there's a lot that we wanted to learn from Neil Cole and his ministry. And, and he talked about it briefly, the idea of as you grow larger, how do you grow smaller? And as you're growing numerically, how do you not become inwardly focused and, and into yourself and completely missing on what it is that God's called us to do as a church? And, and that was kind of our story. And I'm just going to tell you real quickly what our story is and how we began to engage in this thing called missional community, which is kind of the title of this last session here at our conference. Um, we had a contingency plan for numerical failure as a church plant. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever plant a church and you have a contingency plan for numerical failure? If you, you launch and not one single person shows up, you can at least go flip burgers or whatever. And we were prepared for that. But what we weren't prepared for is what you might call numerical success. And, and I don't know if you ever heard of the guy I planted the church with. His name's Chris Tomlin. He's, uh, he's all right at worship leader. He's okay. Um, but we you know, very, very quickly uh, and have continued to see a lot of numerical growth. We just passed over 5,000 this last week. And then you might think that's really good. But one of the things we realize is in a lot of ways in that short a time, it's really, really, really bad. Um, have, you ever had, have you ever had one of those moments where you're kind of engaging uh, from a macro level your church and you're looking at the details of it and in just in a moment of clarity and honesty, you look at your church and you think, we stink at that. We're horrible at it. If you've never had one of those moments, you probably ought to, right? I worked in a staff one time and all we ever did was sit around and talk about how great we were. And I'm sitting, I'm sitting but the, when I became a lead pastor of a church, all I could think about was how much we stink at this. I had one of those moments two years ago when I looked at our efforts to engage these numbers in the community, in the biblical, authentic, real community, the kind of, the kind of community the Bible talks about where people actually love each other um, and, and they engage in each other's needs and they're, and, they're, and they're together and they're walking together through life. And, and, and I looked at our church and I realized we're not very good at this. And here's what we had done up at that point. We created these things called community groups, which is what most churches in America have some form of that. It was uh, formed around the idea that we're going to come together uh, in, a, in a home. We're going to eat chips and dip, right? And then we're going to have Bible study together with, with the hope that community is going to form. It's going to happen. Right, and so we uh, we talked about it. We uh, we trained leaders for this to get the chips and dips out, do the Bible thing. It's going to be great. And people signed up in droves for this program. People signed up in droves. We had tons of groups, and we patted ourselves on the back and said we have created community at our church. Right, but the problem was is that some of them worked, but most of them didn't. Some of them worked. Some of them, some of them formed actual community. Most of them were abysmal failures. They, they, they couldn't connect with one another. Um, they, they didn't feel like they fit in or they become inwardly focused and completely were not on mission to engage culture or the city or people that didn't know Jesus or they, they begin to fight and argue in petty. It, it, it was ridiculous. We stunk at building community as a church. Growing, but stinking at community. What was comforting is I was at a leadership network deal with Linda Stanley, and uh, we were with Wayne Cordero, and he talked to us, Wayne Cordero, the pastor of New Hope in Hawaii, and he gave me a comforting thought, or comforting truth here. He said, he said you know, I hang out with uh, Rick Warren. I hang out with Bill Hybels. I hang out with all these guys that, that do conferences on how to do small groups, and he says, it's interesting because they'll do a conference on a small group and they'll, you know, teach the world about how to build community. But he said, you get alone with them somewhere on an airplane and they'll tell you that they stink at it too. That they're horrible at it. And I thought, that makes me feel better, right? And so, <sighs> stinking at building community is not a good thing for exactly what Neil talked about. As you grow bigger, you have to begin to ask the question of how do we grow in discipleship uh, and in mission community together. Um, it was not a good thing because we, uh, we had just gotten on this, you know, one of those lists of the top fast and growing churches or whatever. And, and what might be privately uh, kind of a proud moment for most pastors was keeping me awake at night. 
because I knew we might have just made a list for the top whatever fastest growing churches of wherever but I knew that I would also make another list if we were making a real true list of churches and that's the top 100 crappiest churches in America at assimilating growth, right? Congratulations, Mr. Carter. You are on the top 10 crappiest churches in America at forming disciples for this huge crowd that's walking in your door, okay? And so what we did in that moment um, is as a staff and as a church, we went back to the drawing board. We went back to the Bible. And we started just asking ourselves the question, what is it in life that actually builds authentic community? What, what are the things out there in the world that actually form this bond, this unity, this community that you see occurring in Scripture? Is there anything we can point at in our culture that we could emulate? We know one of the first things I thought about, and this is not in the Bible, but I thought about the book Band of Brothers. Anybody read Band of Brothers? It's the story of the 101st Airborne um, in World War II, E Company. And here's this group of guys, and they're all in their mid to late 80s now, early 90s. There's some of, uh, some of them uh, that are still alive. And what's interesting about those guys' story is not what they accomplished. That's part of it. And they accomplished a ton. Maybe more than any other unit in World War II, they accomplished a significant amount uh, during that, that theater of war. But what's special about those guys as you study them is the bond they formed. The bond they formed, they are still, the guys that are still alive are still best of friends. They have this deep and abiding bond that formed together that has lasted generations way beyond to the end of their lives, way past the war. Um, also what's interesting is that the bond and the unity and the community these guys have together that has transcended all kinds of cultural boundaries. You've got guys in this group in the 101st Airborne E Company, some that are Jews that are best friends with Christians. You've got some that are from the north that are best friends from guys with Texas. You've got, you've got uh, Catholic guys that are friends with Irish guys. And, and this is community that, that they would lay down in the street for one another. You get them alone in a room. Check this out. You get them alone in a room and you interview them. And one of the things they'll tell you is they have a deeper bond and a deeper community, even sometimes more so than even with their wives. And that, you know, I don't think that's godly, but this is what they're saying. And so you ask the question, what is going on in these guys' lives? What happened to this group of people that formed such a significant sense of community? And the answer is very simple. It's one word. Mission. Mission. It's mission. They, they were on a mission together of significance, and that, and out of that, formed this deep bond. Okay? And that's kind of intuitive. We get that. You ever been in youth ministry? You take a group of kids and you hang out with them for a week, going to movies and doing, you know, eating pizza and stuff. And you, there's a bond there that forms. You take that same group of kids and you take them to Mexico and build a house together. What happens? There's a deeper bond that forms there. And so that was kind of the aha moment for us is we actually, in that moment, as we begin to think about all this stuff, we begin to think about mission in terms of community, we realize, isn't that exactly how Jesus built community? Isn't that exactly how he did it? Because this is what Jesus did. He called his disciples to himself, a group that he would hang out with for about three years, and he did two things in that calling. One, he said, I want you to follow me. He called them to himself, which is great. And secondly, what did he do? He called them to mission. He said, I want you to follow me, and here's what we're going to do together. We're going to make, or I'm going to make you a fisher of men, okay? So we took that principle, um, and we applied it to our small group ministry. We thought, what if, what if we didn't center our small group ministry, which is absolutely essential to have in a church, a place where people can come together and live out the Christian faith together. What if we didn't center it around chips and dips and, and, and necessarily Bible study, which is great, and, and just hanging out together? But what if we centered it around mission and see what flowed out of that? And so we began calling our groups uh, missional communities. All right, didn't, didn't form around my sermon, didn't form around any other thing but a cause, okay? Let me give you one example here and we'll be done. One of my best friends was a missional group leader. His, uh, without exaggeration, was the most dysfunctional community group in our entire church. 
Uh, they, they, uh, maybe you've got some like this. They, they fought all the time. They weren't connecting. People were coming in, but then they were leaving. And uh, yes, they were hanging out. Yes, they were spending time in a, in a Bible study together, but community, in a biblical sense, was not forming at all, okay? And that was kind of indicative throughout our entire church. So what they did is we began to cast this vision for missional community, is they began to look around the city for a need and for a cause, for a mission that they might... Um, come together and be a part of. And they noticed that the University of Texas, which we're near, there are literally thousands of international students. Um, students that are from every possible imaginal, uh, imagined country come to the University of Texas and get educated there. They found out from the university that uh, almost to the person, these international students, one of the greatest problems they have is they will spend their entire four years at the University of Texas and they will not step foot in the home of an American during that entire time. And we thought, what a waste is that? Here are these students that are right in our backyard that are going to go to every corner of the earth and we're not even engaging them. We're not even talking to them. And so what this completely, ridiculously dysfunctional small group did is they made a decision, we're going to go engage these international students. They got together, they pulled their money, they bought a smoker. And they would buy, uh, you know, barbecue. It's what you do in Texas. And they called the University of Texas and they said, can we throw like a Texas style barbecue for these international students? Just engage them, welcome them to Texas. They said, yeah, they got permission. They, they invited every international student at the University of Texas. A thousand of them showed up on the first time. A thousand, okay? One thousand. They estimate it's possibly more than that. They fed them barbecue. They got a, I mean, these kids are from all over the place, barely speak English. They got like a, a square dance guy out there, and, and you got all these foreign, you know, exchange students or whatever. They're, they're square dancing. Okay, and, and that was just kind of step one. But they, how do we engage them in, in the gospel? And so what they did is it was such success. They began to do it, you know, fairly often. They, they gathered all these other missional communities from our church, and they began to recruit them to come to these events, and they got the system in place where families, and the other missional communities could adopt one of these students to, uh, during the semester so they could come over and wash their clothes and eat dinner with them, I don't know, have conversation, you know, and talk about what wired them and what changed their life uh, through Jesus Christ. And it has made such an impact in these international students that uh, this community group is in with the University of Texas and they're literally seeing life change in, in international students. It's unbelievable. Now, here's the crazy 